In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, brothers and sisters in Christ, to this program entitled, Learning to Live in the Divine Will. In the last few segments, we addressed the Christian virtues, the theological virtues, and the moral or cardinal virtues, and then finally the divine virtues. Luisa Picaretta, the servant of God, speaks of divine virtues as a telltale sign of one who lives in God's will, and which is reflected in the angels and the saints who behold the beatific vision, who behold God in this beautiful mode, the beatific mode. We on earth do not enjoy the beatific mode or the beatific vision, but the intuitive vision. Now, interiorly, there's no difference between a soul who lives in the divine will, as Louisa describes them, um, and a soul who lives in heaven, enjoying the beatific vision. Now, Louisa describes them, when I say them, I'm referring to those individuals who live in the divine will, or rather, those angels and saints in heaven, as enjoying, she describes them as enjoying the divine virtues. Divine means that they come directly from God. Now, how does that differ from the theological and moral virtues, as discussed in the previous segments? A divine virtue does not require intentionality or repetition necessarily in order to grow. Let me explain that in a moment. But let me show how the, the divine virtues, unlike the Christian moral theological virtues, do not require intentionality in order to grow. The Christian virtues, the theological virtues, for example, of faith, hope, and love, are given to us freely at baptism, hence theological gifts, freely given gift. They are theological virtues when we exercise them. That's the only difference between the expression theological gift and theological virtue. Their gift, in as much as they are freely given, virtue, in as much as they are now exercised by the recipient of these gifts. So, we can grow in faith, hope, and love through the repetition of these virtues. We exercise our faith, we exercise our hope, and we exercise our love in different ways. Now, repetition enables them to grow, and the same dynamic applies to the cardinal or moral virtues. For example, prudence, temperance, fortitude, right, the and others, these all require repetition, all right? Now, the divine virtues, these are infused by God, okay? Above and beyond repetition and intentionality, they are infused directly by God into either an angel or saint in heaven, when they're given the beatific vision, right? Or to a soul who lives in the divine will on earth, like Luisa Picaretta. Or like Saint Hannibal Francia. Or like other mystics who have not had access to Luisa's writings, but nonetheless received this gift, like Saint Faustina Kowalska, Placidina Berlanger, Venerable Concepcion Cabrera de Armida, and the list goes on and on. I've mentioned about 12 of these contemporary mystics that the Church has raised to its altars and acknowledged by an official seal of approval their writings as authentic, as ex 
individuals who receive the gift of living in the divine will. I acknowledge these. There are about 12, at least, that, are, that lived after Louisa and received the gift like Louisa. But again, there are degrees in this gift. Louisa went all the way to the center, right? Many of the other saints who received this gift may have not gone all the way to the center of this gift. Nonetheless, the gift they received. Okay? The divine virtues God infuses in a soul who lives in the divine will. And these divine virtues, as I mentioned in the previous segment, enable the soul's prayers, thoughts, and actions to impact all time concomitantly. So when a soul prays in God's will, the divine virtues enable it, its prayers, its thoughts, its words, to transcend the confines of time and space. Remember, the soul is not bound by time or space. The body is. And when we pray, we are exercising a faculty of the soul which is the intellect and the will. We desire in our prayer, that's an exercise of the will, right? We intend when we pray, and that is an exercise of the intellect. So when I say the Mass, for example, I offer it up for this intention, right? Souls in purgatory, my deceased loved ones, an end to abortion, euthanasia, um, protection of one's own God-given rights and liberties, safe arrival of people who travel, um, an end to war, hunger, division. These are all intentions God enjoys for us to express, you see. Now, we do not have to form the intention, however, to receive the divine virtues, like we do the theological and moral virtues that require intentionality and repetition. Okay. Now, God infuses these divine virtues in us. Now, why do they not require intentionality or repetition? Well, number one, because we cannot do anything in our own human power to engender the gift of transtemporality. Transtemporality is the ability to impact all things throughout time in our thoughts, words, and actions. We cannot garner the strength to do this by ourselves. Only God can do this in us, right? Hence divine virtues. God infuses within us this propensity that is not germane to human nature, at least after its fallen state, that is, after it's conceived in original sin, but it is to its state before original sin or in its glorified state in the beatific mode in heaven. Right? These divine virtues are not natural to fallen man. They are not. They cannot be reacquired through human effort. Only God can reactualize these divine virtues in the human soul who lives in the divine will, right? which enables that soul to impact all things of all time. I mentioned other qualities in the previous segment associated with the exercise of the divine virtues. Now, I said they don't need repetition, they don't need intentionality, but I mentioned exercise. All right. How are they exercised? They are virtues, after all, and virtues are subject to exercise. They are exercised through our divine acts. All right. So the divine acts we perform require repetition. And what are these divine acts that God absorbs in his one eternal act in order to bequeath to us his divine virtues? They can be the rounds throughout creation that we repeat every day. They can be the meditation on the hours of the passion that we may repeat every day. They may be the prevenient morning offering act that we repeat every day, or the present act that Louisa did every day, which is in the moment, in the present, in which she offers herself unconditionally to God in this very moment, every thought, word, and action of hers, 
she elevates, lifts up, and God absorbs these in such a way that he, in so doing, he bequeaths to the soul the propensity to impact all things of all time through those thoughts, words, and actions. Okay? Now, the divine virtues are gifts. They, we do nothing to acquire them. Just like the theological gifts at baptism are given due to no effort of our own or merit of our own, likewise the divine gifts that God gives us. Now, Jesus refers to them as divine virtues, inasmuch as they are exercised through our, as I just mentioned, rounds, prayers, meditations, and so forth. We impact all things of all time in praying, thinking, and acting. In this segment, I will now talk about Louisa's exercise okay, of the divine virtues, um, of the heroic virtues. She remember, Louisa also had exercised all the theological and Christian moral cardinal virtues. She didn't just limit herself to the divine virtues. She exercised them all. Now, in order of importance or merit, the divine virtues are the greatest, naturally, because they are the exercise that Adam and Eve were able to perform in Eden before sin. When I say the exercise they were able to perform, what I'm referring to is the exercise of these divine virtues that they were performing through their rounds in creation, through their actions of thank you, I love you, I bless you, God. Right? These expressions of gratitude, thanksgiving, praise, honor, worship, all these were exercises that they were performing in the Garden of Eden, interior exercises, right, of the soul, whereby their thoughts, words, desires, prayers were impacting all things of all time and increasing the glory of all things of all time. Throughout Louise's writings, Jesus provides confirmations that not only did she live in God's will, but possess these virtues in heroic degree. This is evident in Volume 3 on May 21st, 1900. This is further bolstered by Jesus' affirmation that she received more grace than Adam, right? I mentioned that in the last segment, and that came from Volume 20 on October 26th, 1926. Why did Louisa have more grace than Adam? Well, let me allow Jesus to answer that question for you, as I did in the last segment. Jesus tells Louisa, In Adam, I did not infuse my humanity that should serve him as his aid and strength, or as the cortege of my will, as I was not yet incarnate. But I have fused in you, Louisa, my incarnate humanity, to provide you with all the necessary aid to enable your will to remain in the place established by God and for my will to reign in you so that together we might accomplish your rounds in my eternal will and establish its kingdom. So Christ's incarnate humanity Adam did not enjoy the effects of, Louisa did. Hence, more grace Louisa received than Adam. Also, because Louisa did not fail as Adam did, had Adam not failed and passed the test of being loyal to God's imperative not to partake of that forbidden fruit, had Eve and Adam been faithful, they perhaps would have surpassed Louisa in grace. We don't know. But what we do know is that they, because of their failure, Adam and Eve's failure, they never established a kingdom in their soul. Jesus tells this to Louisa. In fact, Jesus goes so far as to say that in Adam, because of his original sin, the, all you can find are the first steps, right? This comes from volume 25 
December 21st, 1928. He tells her, Since man descended from my divine will to live in his own will, he lost the echo of his Creator, and therefore the model that was to serve to renew our operation within our works. So it can be said that in this void there is nothing other than the first steps of man. All the rest is empty. And yet this void must be filled. This is why I await with so much love the acts of those who will live and must live in my will. Okay, so here you have an example of Jesus telling Louisa that Adam had a void in his soul, as we all do when we're created in God's image and likeness. At conception, God gives us a natural law to discern right from wrong, without any formal instruction, in general terms. And he also gives us a void, which is to be filled with divine acts that God has predestined for us from eternity. Now, Adam was given this void, but failed to fill it with these divine acts. Why? Because although he started doing divine acts, he interrupted them with original sin and lost the propensity to do them ever again. Not ever again could Adam do them until he, was, he would die and Jesus would resurrect and he would take Adam after his resurrection, along with a host of other souls in limbo, up to heaven with him. Only then, to Adam was restored the propensity to perform his divine acts again, but without merit. See, in heaven, or in purgatory, there is no merit on the part of the saints. Why? Because they cannot sin. On earth, there is merit, because we can sin, but don't. Nonetheless, Adam was given this grace, but lost it, and he and Eve as well, but Louisa did not. So Louisa surpassed Adam in that sense, and uh, she filled her void, her soul that had a void, with all these divine acts that God had intended for her to deposit within her will from all eternity, and she succeeded in doing that. And that was quite a feat. <laughs> that is heroic in and of itself. And this heroic effort on the part of Louisa, Jesus confirms many times throughout her text. I gave you already volume 3 as an example, May 21st, 1900, and also volume 15, June 6th, 1923. And in this volume here that I will quote to you, it is evident that although Louisa performed many heroic acts, Adam failed to perform one. Adam did and Eve did not perform one heroic act. If they passed the test, they would have. Consider the following excerpt in which Jesus tells Louisa. Why did Adam sin? because he withdrew his gaze from the divine attraction, and as Eve presented him with the forbidden fruit for him to eat, he looked at it, and his sight drew pleasure from what he saw. His hearing enjoyed Eve's words, who told him that if he had eaten it, he would have become like God, and in eating it, his mouth tasted it, which constituted right, constituted the first act of his undoing. Instead, if Adam was displeased in looking at the fruit, repulsed and unmoved at the sound of Eve's words, and disgusted at the idea of eating it, he would have accomplished the first heroic act of his life, as he would have resisted and corrected Eve for having tempted him and he would have retained the immortal crown of fidelity toward the one to whom he owed so much, and who possessed all the rights to his sonship." Unquote. All right, this tells us that Adam and Eve did not perform one heroic act. Louisa did, you see. Not only that, had Adam corrected Eve after Eve sinned, original sin would not have affected the human race. That's correct. Why? Because not Eve, but Adam was the head of the human race. And Eve was 
not being the head, not in a position to impair all human generations. Only the head could do that, sort of like a tree. Consider the head the roots, and consider, which is Adam, and consider a branch, Eve, okay? Now you can sever the branch, but it doesn't affect the whole tree. But if you affect the roots, the whole tree is affected. And for that reason, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, God tells Adam not to partake of the forbidden fruit. He doesn't tell Eve. Okay, five verses, I think, 2, 15, 2, 16 of Genesis. And Eve learns through Adam, okay? And God did not expel Eve from Eden until after Adam, you see, had sinned because it was the sin of Adam that infected the human race. And that is why Jesus became a male human being, not a female. Because since sin came into the world through man, who is the head, it must be expelled from the world through man, who is the head. Hence Paul's reference to Adam and Jesus as the Adam of the earth and the Adam of the spirit, the old Adam and the new Adam. Garbage in, garbage out, right? Sin comes in, and sin is expelled. All right, now, this is also why men are ordained priests only, and not women. Because the work of the priesthood, the ministerial the priesthood, right? Not the common priesthood. The ministerial ordained priesthood is reserved for men for the reason that Due to no superiority or inferiority, I'm not talking about that at all, but due to the different roles God had established from eternity in genders on earth. You see, the male gives the seed, and the woman receives the seed, nurtures the seed, and engenders life. That's exactly how the divine acts were performed in Eden and in Adam and Eve. Adam received first from God the gift of living in the divine will. Then... Eve, all of Adam's acts that he deposited within his soul when he was trying to establish this kingdom, which we know he failed to do on account of original sin, but which he was trying to do, he passed on to Eve, you see? And Eve received these, these, this impulse of Adam's love, his activity, and she embodied it and passed it on to her progeny. This was the plan A but it was interrupted from sin, by sin, okay? Certainly, Eve received direct grace from God. Certainly, all the offspring of Adam and Eve received grace directly from God. But let's recall the words of Louisa. Jesus tells her, remember, Louisa's writing, but Jesus is speaking. Anyone who receives the gift of living in the divine will must receive it through three individuals, not one. It must go from Christ to Mary to Louisa to the individual. It cannot bypass Louisa, it cannot bypass Mary, it cannot bypass Jesus. Similarly, the gift of living in the divine will in Eden could not bypass Adam. So anyone who received the gift invariably received it as a fruit of Adam's love, a fruit of Adam's effort, you see. Now, Adam interrupted this gift, so it was given over to Jesus, the new Adam, and Mary, the new Eve. However, since they knew no sin, were not conceived in sin, and we are, Jesus chose one from among our own human stock, conceived just like us in sin, and that is... Louisa. Okay? And the male representative is Saint Hannibal di Francia. Jesus tells this to Louisa as well. All right? Very few people, I think, who are aware of the fact that Saint Hannibal lived in the divine will. Jesus calls him the first apostle of the divine will in Louisa's writings. And he had a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the infant Virgin Mary before he died. In fact, if you go to Messina to see his body, which is incorrupt, of course, it's encased with this sort of like bronze material to preserve it. Um, you will see, all right, that's in the church of St. Anthony, where St. Hannibal's body is, which I've been to. 
But you'll also see at his deathbed in the house where he died, which is on the second floor of an apartment, um, a, fo a painting of the infant Blessed Mother appearing to St. Hannibal on his deathbed. And that event actually happened, and it's in the, it's in the uh, writings of Hannibal, letters. Um, and that was, uh, that was his mystical marriage right there. You know, he, he enjoyed that beautiful experience right before he died. Now, um, we, like Louisa, conceived in original sin, are invited by God to, like Adam and Eve and Louisa and Jesus and Mary, perform divine acts and exercise divine virtue. Among the heroic virtues Louisa embodied, noteworthy are perfect resignation. That disposes the soul to acquire the most heroic love, which is a seal of sure predestination. Okay? and which disposes the soul for heroism in all the virtues. Among the divine virtues Louisa illustrates, worthy of mention, is the unifying virtue. The unifying virtue empowers the soul's acts to continuously unite all things, rational and irrational, sustain all things, and communicate a divine light and life to all things and form of them one single act with innumerable effects. These teachings come from Louise's volume 26, July 30th, 1929. Consider that the universe is held together by God's grace. Natural grace is what the scholastics call it. There are different types of grace, which is really God's aid in the universe. Natural grace is God's emulsifying agent, so to speak, in the cosmos that keeps all things in symbiosis. It keeps the ecosystem alive. It makes all things work in harmony. Now, sin disrupts this. It makes things work in disorder. This is why we have ice ages, had ice ages, floods, earthquakes, you know, pestilence, um, all these natural diseases, uh, aggressions, um, disasters, are the result of sin, disordering this harmony in the universe. Well, acts in the divine will establish a unifying virtue within the soul that enables all things to return to their primordial unity. Consider St. Paul's 8th chapter to the Romans where he says, All creation groans with eager longing, waiting to be freed from its slavery to, to corruption, and enjoy the glorious freedom of the sons of God. Creation will be set free and will enjoy this glorious freedom. Now, St. Paul here is alluding to, I believe, the period of the future where God's will is established on earth, where creation is set free from its slavery to corruption, by the way, what enslaved sla cre creation to slavery? Sorry, what enslaved creation to corruption? Original sin. Satan. Adam and Eve's original sin. And Jesus began the work of restoring, redeeming the cosmos. He didn't finish it. He began the work. We are co-redeemers with him. And Father Walter Chiswick who was a priest who was in Russia in the Gulag for many years for his testament to Christ and the gospel. He suffered on behalf of his living testament, his life testament. He um, states that Christ's work of redemption is not complete. It, it began with Christ, and it will not be complete until all the baptized have united their wills with God's will. I quote his... Uh, his statement in my work that bears the preface of two Catholic bishops entitled The Splendor of Creation. In this book, Father Walter Chiswick, he's quoted there, and I'm recalling his quotation, paraphrasing me. The divine virtues, therefore, engender within the soul a unifying quality that empowers it 
to continuously unite, sustain, and communicate divine light and life to all things. Louisa reveals that God imparts to each soul who lives in his will um, even the most indifferent acts, such as breathing, sleeping, a divine virtue of continuous motion in his will. Think of that. This is an infused gift, okay? We cannot acquire it by pure human effort. Jesus tells this to Louise in volume 13 on September 14th, 1921, and in other excerpts. Okay. All right. Now I want to pause, as I always do, and uh, remind you of the importance of continuing to manifest your support for Radio Maria by helping in any way you can to maintain this broadcast and this radio station to continue to inform you with good, solid truths. Okay? Now, in that pause, a few things came to my mind. One is the recent situation in the Church with Pope Francis and the media's attention to a statement by Archbishop Vigano. Also, what came to my mind in the, the, while I was talking was um, the idea of the volumes of Louisa, which are ready in Italian, but won't be out for a few more months. Um, right. Let me first address the volumes, then I'll address Pope Francis. I'm trying to keep this always within the context of God's divine will. All right. The volumes. Um, Louisa's volumes were the fruit of many priests and theologians, not one person, okay? First of all, consider that Louisa wrote in dialect, a Poulian dialect, and the, the volumes therefore first had to be transliterated, okay, before translated. So they had to be taken from the poor, impoverished Italian dialect and recast into the standard Italian language. That was done by several priests. That was done over 20 years. Let me, this was, that was done, uh, I'm thinking out loud here, about 20 years ago. And I know the priests who were involved because I was in Corrado at the time. All right, and they did a wonderful job, wonderful priests too. Then after that first phase, right? Oh, let me backpedal one step. Before the volumes, right, were in the hands of the archdiocese, they were in the hands of a man from Italy, northern Italy, in the city of Bergamo called Andrea Magnifico. Why did he have sole copy, um, rights of copy, copying, profit, and diffusion? These are three rights that the Italian state gives to an author of any work. A right of co it's called copyright. Okay, right, a right to copy the the work, to print the work, and to diffuse. I'm sorry, to make a profit off of the work. Three rights. These only Andrea Magnifico had. Why? Because when, when Luisa Picaretta died, the Italian government, considering her the author of these 36 volumes and other works she wrote, put into practice the Italian state law, which is when the author dies. The writings go to the heirs of the author. And there were three heirs. And these three heirs had these writings but didn't know what to do with them. So since they knew Andrea Magnifico, right, and they knew he had a printing press, they gave them to him. That is, they gave them him all the volumes, the originals, right, except for volume 35 and 6. And then they... Um, gave him also the rights by Italian law to copy, print, and profit. Three rights. Okay. Then at the, uh, there was a meeting in Corrado by private invitation. I was present there where we all met. Andrea Magnifico was there and his, his um, associate, who is now the head of the printing press in Bergamo, Francesco Gamba, and there were other wonderful people representing Louisa from all over the world. And that's where Andrea Magnifico and Archbishop Picchieri, who has since deceased, they both have since deceased, 
met and decided to make this mutual agreement that Andrea would share with the archdiocese, give to the archdiocese, this copyright of this Italian law protected copyright whereby the archdiocese could now copy, print, and make a profit off the writings of Louisa. Nevertheless, in this agreement, Andrea Magnifico had a little um, caveat in which he said that his printing press would be of essential support in the diffusion of Louisa's writings. Okay, now we, that brings us full circle back to the writings of Louisa after they were given to the archdiocese. Now they were transliterated from poor Italian to standard Italian. Okay, now the writings were then submitted to several theologians in Rome. All right, I know them as well by name and by I met them as well. And I spoke with them and shared with them also ideas of the theology of Louisa because they knew I was doing a doctorate on her writings. And they, um, of course, worked on the theology, not so much the grammar. The grammar is a part of it, but mostly the substance, not the form. Okay. So the substance took years to work out, 36 volumes correcting the substance, because Louisa made mistakes in her writings. Yes, she did. I know that for a fact, because I have the originals. I was given them for my doctoral dissertation. It's no secret, and the Archdiocese and other people know this. All right. I even have a letter from members of the Archdiocese confirming that my thesis contains the originals, not simply pro-manuscripts, not simply um, fake versions or versions that are in circulation that are not. These are the authentic ones that are in my dissertation. All right. Now, um, these uh, these substantial chain, uh, modifications to her volumes were necessary. I'll give you an example where Louisa makes, makes a mistake theologically, unintentional, of course. All mystics make some unintentional mistakes. And it's obvious that it's unintentional because it's contradicted elsewhere in their writings. All right. She, for example, refers to the internal work of God, which is known in Latin as ad intra operatio, God's internal operation, which is only one. God is one eternal act. He's not a succession of acts, okay? God is only, this is important, only one act. Why one act? Because with God there is no time. With us there is. So we progress from the past to the present to the future. We go through a succession, a temporal motion from potency to action. God is never in potency. St. Thomas Aquinas refers to God in this sense as a simple substance, whereas we are a composite substance. We move from potency to action. God is always in act. He's always in the present. That's why he tells Moses, I am sent you. Those two words, I am, which is how Moses knew God's name, reveals God's eternal act. God is always in the present. He's never in the past or the future. All time is present to God. Okay, now Louisa, in her writings, sometimes refers to God's internal act in the plural, which is incorrect. It's only one. It's always in the singular. It's ad inter operatio o, with an o at the end, a singular. Okay? Now, um, Louisa... Okay, therefore, her writings had to be um, edited, tweaked, without changing anything theologically, just correcting unintentional errors in grammar as well as in substance, form as, as well as in substance. All right, now that took place. That finished a few months ago. Now we're at the point where the substantial changes are all done. The theology is ready. All that has to be done is the least important. I would say, maybe other people disagree with me, but I'm speaking as a theologian, the most important theologically is doctrine, it's substance. It's not the form, the grammar. That's, that's important too, but not as important as substance. Okay, so what's being done now is just the grammar, just the form. 
correcting the punctuations, blah, blah, blah. That's what's being done now by a priest and a few other lay people helping him. And that's, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg that's being done right now. That's where we are. And that's good. So everything is in the clear. So we're hoping that Louisa will be beatified next year, by the end of next year, and it's very possible she will be. Okay? That's the good news. Now, it still will be a little while before the English volumes come out, because this official version that has just come out fresh from the theologian's hands is only in Italian. Okay? Now, when the Italian version comes out, then of course it will be sent to different countries to be translated and printed in different book publishing presses. So, And then, then it will be very nice to have the official volumes once and for all. Now, I have, I have the originals, of course, a few other people do. And this is why some people have asked me, should I read all 36 volumes? And I say, sure, why not? Whoever tells you not to. And they said, well, I heard we're not supposed to read the volumes. And my answer to them is, well, who told you that? And they said, the archdiocese told us it's forbidden for anyone to print or post all 36 volumes or sell them. And I said, that's absolutely correct. And that's still in force today. And they say, why? And my answer again, the archdiocese gave this prohibition for two reasons that I'm aware of. I spoke with Archbishop Picchieri, as well as Cassati, Archbishop Cassati, and they gave me these reasons. One, because the volumes in circulation today that people have, not all people have them, but those that do, contain some errors. Now, is this true? Absolutely it's true, because I've seen them, and I compare them with the originals, and they do have some errors. They're not many, but they're there. And the reader has a right to know this. Why? Because suppose they read something that's not from Louisa, that's been modified, and they take it as from Louisa, and they're misinformed. That's not good for them. So, the people need to be made aware that these volumes are not the final of authorized official version, and they're not. The ones that are in, cir that are in circulation are not the final version, and the people have a right to be made aware of that. Right? All right. Another reason is because people, when they're reading the 30, these volumes, the 36 that are available to, and again, they contain errors, will interpret it in such a way that it may cause some controversy as it had in the past. It's no mystery to those of you listening that there was a moratorium for a while on all conferences on the divine will, on all printings, which is still in force today of Louisa's, of the volumes of Louisa. And the reason is because it was causing controversy. Why was it causing controversy? Well, you all know the answer to that. The volumes were being misinterpreted by people that were not theologians. It's as simple as that. And I admire the zeal of these individuals. Don't get me wrong. But zeal must be monitored with or I should say tempered with humility and proper guidance. The humility means I submit my interpretation to the church before spreading it elsewhere, right? And how do they do that? You can consult a theologian, consult a priest who knows his spiritual, moral, his mystical theology well, or dogmatic theology well, right? But some people that lack that humility were not submitting their interpretations to proper individuals and promoting them, and some bishops got wind of it, and they wrote Rome. And I know these bishops as well, and I have copies of their letters. They were very displeased with the way the volumes were being misinterpreted. Okay, Now this is a short version of the, the volumes and why people were of the impression that you cannot read the 36. Okay, the, the fact of the matter is, um, the church does not give us the 36 volumes. It's against the will of the church. The church never gave us the 36 volumes. Let us be clear on that, okay? So, although they were somehow um, distributed, their authenticity, as I mentioned, is disputed in their entirety because they contain errors. All right, now, 
Um, when I was in the Philippines in 2013, I was giving a retreat at the request of the cardinal and the bishop. They invited me to give a retreat to all the priests and to all the laity and religious, which I did. I was there for about two weeks giving talks. And um, someone video recorded, I think, my talks and posted it. And in it, someone asked me, why do you say most of you will find it difficult to read the 36 volumes? And therefore, I recommend my dissertation to read because it's difficult to read the 36. Well, in answer, now you know why I said that. Why? Because in 2013, the volumes were prohibited to all the people, all 36, you see. Whereas in my dissertation, all 36 are there and approved by the Pontifical University of Rome. So here you have, for the first time in the church, a book approved by a Pontifical University of Rome that contains the 36 volumes, the first time in the church. All right? Now, I'd never discourage anyone from reading the volumes, nor in that talk in Manila did I discourage. I simply said it's difficult. Since it's difficult for most of you to read the 36, now you know why I said that. Because it's difficult for you to get the originals. It's almost impossible, to be quite frank, because the church has not to this date released them, you see? So being practical, I'm thinking, okay, since they can't have the original 36, what other way can they have them? Well, for the time being, read the dissertation. Not only does it contain all 36, but it also it presents it in a systematically theological way, which the volumes don't. Remember, Louisa did not write as a theologian. She did not write in such a way that references to Adam were in one section references to Eve and another, references to... She, she wrote scattered, in a very scattered way. So when you read the volumes, you're not going to have a theological grasp of the fiats of creation, redemption, sanctification in their entirety as they could be if... Um, uh, if, for example, you would have by reading them in a systematically theological, presentable way, okay? That's a backward way of me trying to put it like this, put it more simply like this. Louisa wrote in an uncoordinated and scattered manner. And when you read those writings, you read beautiful things, but not in a system, a format, okay? There are no chapters, no verses, okay? In the dissertation, you have all that. So what I've done is I've extrapolated from her 36 volumes all references to creation and put them in one chapter, beginning with God's creation of Adam, then moving on to Eve, then the fall, then the redemption, and so forth. Then I extrapolate all references to redemption, put them in another chapter, then sanctification, which is the biggest of all chapters in the thesis, and I address that as well. All right. Then I compare Louise's writings with 2,000 years of church theology to show that they are consistent with tradition. So I compare them with the Greek writers, Greek theologians, and the Latin theologians, the patristics and the scholastics. All right. That's for the volumes. Now, with regard to Pope Francis and what's going on, never forget one simple truth in all this. The primacy of Peter was given directly by Jesus to Peter. This uh, supreme, immediate, universal authority that the Pope has, regardless of who he is, is a gift from God to the Church that no evil force can take away. All right? This is very important. Always be united with the teachings of the Pope. Always, always, always. If ever a priest or an archbishop should state publicly that the Pope's authentic magisterium is illicit, do not follow that archbishop or priest. Do not. That is not only a teaching against the Church's magisterium, it's in the First Vatican Council, it's in the Second Vatican Council, it's in the Lateran Council, where the Pope's primacy, authentic magisterium, extraordinary magisterium, 
universal and immediate authority are upheld. Okay? Follow these teachings of the Church on the primacy of Peter. Don't follow what this priest or that archbishop or whoever else says if, if they question the Pope's authentic magisterium. Okay? And unfortunately that's happening today. And this was prophesied in several Church-approved apparitions such as Akita, Japan, okay, and um, elsewhere. Even in the writings of a mystic living today that has the imprimatur nihil obstat, they talk about what's going on in the Church today, a sense of confusion. But I encourage you to, like Don Bosco, who had that vision of the Eucharist, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the Pope, to be united to these three pillars that will lead you home safely, to your heavenly home. The Eucharist was the highest of the two pillars, and then the Blessed Mother. But we cannot get to these two pillars without the Pope leading us there. So in Don Bosco's vision, he saw the Church in the end times being assailed by enemy ships who were using the media to bring down the Catholic Church. This is what the weapons of war were. They were bullets, but they were also magazines and periodicals. This is today's media, trying to bring down the Catholic Church and the Pope at the same time. Right? We are living in these days, and I encourage you to stay, stay the course, never deviate from fidelity to the Eucharist, which is always the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the resurrected divine Jesus Christ, and two, the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of all human beings, Mother of the cosmos, and three, the papacy. Regardless of who the Pope is, the papacy is, a, is what is restraining the rebellion, the apostasy from breaking out. This is what Paul alludes to in a second letter to the Thessalonians when he says there is something restraining this abomination of desolation from entering the sanctuary of God. You know what that restrainer is? This is revealed in the approved, church-approved writing of mystics. It is the, po the papacy. Yes. Once the papacy, the enemies will try to remove it. If they succeed in removing it for a little while, then they will also seek to remove the Eucharist, the perpetual sacrifice. All right. So remember, stay faithful to the papacy, to the Eucharist, to the Blessed Mother, and to the divine will, and to the Church from whom, from whom the volumes come. Okay? May God bless you and keep you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.